Hi friends and uh, welcome to this session. So we'll be discussing about pylon fractures, pylon, pylon, whatever you want to call that. Uh, a little different in the sense, it'll be a case-based discussion of how do we decide how to treat that. So what happens is many times we know all the theory, but when practically it comes to treating these patients, uh, we find it a little confusing as to what needs to be done. So I thought we'll just uh, brief upon how we can uh, decide on how to treat. Now, we all know most pylon fractures, intraarticular or metaphyseal fractures will require surgery. Now, once we have decided a surgery is required, a, a question comes, what approach, what implant, where, all those things. So those things may be clear by the end of this talk. That's how this talk will be. So they are bad injuries in the sense, uh, number one, most of them are significantly comminuted. They will have cartilage damage. They will have bone voids. Plus the soft tissue around that as such is not great, right? So we know that uh, distal tibia is almost uh, subcutaneous bone. So there's not enough muscular coverage around the bone. So any damage more often than not will cause uh, open injuries or even bad soft tissues surrounding the bone. Even if not, that will be so much inflammation going on that the surgical uh, procedure as such itself can cause uh, wound healing problems, skin breakdowns, infections, all those things. So that's why considering all of these, these are one of the most difficult fractures to treat, right? Not necessarily of uh, what implant, but overall from the prognosis point of view. And because of all these things, there is no consensus as such what exactly is the right way of treating these. Now, uh, say we have a distal femur fracture or proximal tibia fractures, we all know what has to be done, when it has to be done. Whereas for distal tibia, there are actually two schools of thought. Now, one school of thought is go as early as possible, treat everything in. Uh, um, and the other school of thought is wait for uh, wrinkles to appear and then do. So both have their own pros and cons. Uh, so we will see what best can be done. And no matter how well the surgery is done, like I told the key uh, prognostic factor will be the soft tissue structure around the skin, around, around the bone, which many times is damaged by itself during the injury. So the prognosis will totally depend on that. And hence, it will be very difficult to predict that the result of this particular uh, treatment is going to be great. Okay. Um, and a uh, lot of times we see that there'll be so much combination that no matter what, the long-term outcomes is going to be poor. So it might lead to malunions, uh, um, secondary arthritis, painful ankle joints, all those, even so many times patients end up with a bad equinus, all those things are a concern. So difficult to predict, difficult to decide. All these things are a uh, nuance when we start treating pylon fractures. So <clears throat> let us see if we can do something more easily from our point of view. Now, how do we decide? Most at the foremost comes what exactly is the condition of the soft tissue. It might not be as bad as what we can see in this picture, but many a times, I mean, almost always the soft tissue will be poor. Okay, it may be closed, but the condition will be poor. There will be redness, erythema, swelling, uh, blisters like in this case, hemorrhagic blisters, all those things. But even uh, unless it is like a elderly patient with a domestic fall, low velocity injury, most all uh, most always it is a high velocity injury and the soft tissue uh, will be uh, damaged. And uh, what all do we need to evaluate? Again, uh, radiograph, two planes, AP and lateral view should be enough in most cases. CT scan is mandatory. Now, this is a dictum now for treating any intraarticular fractures. Okay, in current day orthopedics, we, we would not like to treat an uh, intraarticular fracture without having a CT scan because it tells us so many things. What all are we looking for? I'll just come to that in the next slides. But CT scan becomes mandatory. In that, even a 2D CT is giving much more information than 3D. Okay, all of us make a habit of reading the 2D, yeah, the axial, coronal, and sagittal images. That gives almost all the information. Then later on, we can have a look at 3D, but that is secondary. But most information is given by axial, sagittal, and coronal 2D images. So what are the different approaches as a surgeon that we have? We can have the anteromedial approach to the distal tibia, the anterolateral approach, the posterolateral approach, and posteromedial approach. Now, all of these approaches individually have been covered. They are like, in the app, so you can have a look if for those of you who have not seen it. Uh, I'm not going to cover in detail regarding the approach in this talk. In this talk, we basically be a practical based uh, solution of what needs to be done. Okay, so these are the different four approaches that we have to treat uh, pylon fractures: anterolateral, anteromedial, 
postolateral, postal middle, and combination of any of these could be done. Okay, and the prognosis, like I told, depends on the soft tissue. Many of these are open injuries with contamination. Many times the joint is out, uh, exposed. All these uh, play a big role in uh, overall functioning of this particular joint. Okay, and there may be bone loss if there is open wound, uh, but even otherwise, even in close injuries, there's a lot of bone voids that will be so much crushing happening that you will see a big void once you recreate the articular surface. Okay, and like what we can see is multiple cartilage uh, damage. So much combination of the articular surface that no matter what we do, it will not be. It will be uh, next to impossible. Number one to achieve back the anatomical reduction of the articular cartilage. Number two, even if we by whatever means achieve that, these pieces will be so small. They'll be osteochondral injuries that they will not have any blood supply of its own, and the prognosis is going to be poor. Right. So even that needs to be considered when we take a decision to treat these injuries. So. What we can do from our perspective is be prepared with all the instrumentation, the um, uh, X-Fix, if it's there, it's it's a good tool. But even otherwise, uh, even, even if it's not there, what we need to have is this channel distractors so that we can distract the joint and have more space to play with. It's one of the very important key tools when we treat uh, articular factors, especially proximity behind distal tibia. The implants, uh, Anything in the sense, I just show images where we can use any implant for that matter. So the uh, uh, small fragment sets, 3.5 system, even uh, nowadays we have anatomical plates, but even without them, we might require many time uh, implant, which can be used in a buttress mode or just in a raft mode. All those things uh, are key to getting back the reduction and uh, providing stability. And then, uh, Many cases will require augments in the sense it could either be bone graft or bone substitute. So depending on the institute and depending on the patient's preference, we could take a call. There's no advantage of one over the other. Bone graft is, uh, uh, I mean, ready available, all patients will have it, but it requires one more surgery and some more morbidity, whereas bone substitutes is commercially available. Uh, it's, it's it's costly, So, uh, but that morbidity is not there. So, Depending on pros and cons, it could, it could be decided what, what needs to be done. There is no advantage of one over the other, like I told. Okay, but we need to be prepared with this. And how do we decide? Like I told, CT scan is uh, the uh, key element which helps us decide what approach we need to take and what uh, implant where we need to place. Okay, and even in CT scan, the crucial thing will be the axial. This is very much similar to the proximal tibia in which the axial section shows us the lowest classification or even the modified short squares classification and we will be able to uh, interpret as to which implant has to be used and where. Similarly, in even distal tibia, it helps us. So this is the image that we need to see. Uh, in this, this is the fibula, the lateral malli. We have the anterolateral fragment, the and the medial fragment, also called the anteromedial fragment. So that's the medial fragment. That's the anterolateral fragment, Shakut fragment, and that's the postal fragment of Walkman. So these are the key three uh, fragments, the big uh, triangular pieces of bone in the distal tibia. So distal tibia, we can divide into three components, the medial, the anterolateral, and the posterior fragment. So, okay, so we need to see where the injuries are and where the combination is. So the routine classification, routine algorithm classification, or EO classification is not... I mean, it is it is good from description purpose, but the working classification uh, for analyzing and treating of these fractures is what was described in 2007 by Sirkin et al. So it is very simple that we look at the X-ray and CT and decide how do we fix it. So that's how the working classification is. So what do we need to do? Always look in the fibula first. 